So we started in ancient Egypt with Isis. Uh, we moved to Mesopotamia with Ishtar and Tammuz. Now we move to the Indus Valley. Uh, notice that these are river civilizations, river cultures. There's a reason for that. Something happens when people don't have to wander around for their meals, uh, following game or following um, uh, whatever. They're just looking for their next meal. When they can settle down, when we can settle down and depend on a food source, some interesting things start to happen. Uh, for example, uh, we start to notice rhythms of nature, right? And we start to notice, the, uh, we humans, start to notice the relationship between sexuality and fertility in the ground, from our own sexuality and that of the earth. We start to see the stars um, because we're in one place and we can now map them better. And we start to see the relationship of the stars to all these cycles we're seeing. And it, soon it becomes as above, so below, right? And there's this, again, this kind of harmony in these ancient cultures, mythological, symbolic harmony. I don't mean lack of conflict. I don't mean that at all. I, in fact, I mean a way to negotiate the conflict that is lost to us now because it is a culture of myth uh, and we're a culture of not myth. Uh, we're a culture of so-called rationality, but um, as we've spoken about many times, we're a culture, we're a literate culture. We're a culture that has its information static and in a place, in a, in a thing, like a book or a device. And so that changes the human psyche. If information and communication go from dynamic interaction between human beings with, within physical space of each other, to something that is distant, remote, and static, that changes who we are. And we're going to see that happen as we move through these cultures and, and these couples. So this um, culture in the Indus River Valley is very, very interesting. 5000 BCE, we start to see evidence of religious practices. Now, uh, any religious study scholar will tell you that Religi religious practice is typically burial. Uh, I mean, because it makes no sense to bury your dead. It makes no logical sense. You just, you know, let them rot or whatever. But when you start burying your dead, especially when you do it in certain elaborate ways, it indicates that you think something is happening about your, um, your loved one and where he or she is going. So, um, 5,000 BC, so again, we're, we're in ancient, ancient territory in terms of time. It's a Harappan culture we're talking about. Uh, farming settlement, settlements around 4,000. Urbanization around 3,000. So another thing that happens um, when you settle, and, and you have to settle around river valleys because that's where the food source is. That's where the fertile soil is because it's being uh, the silt is building up or, it's, or there are floods and it overflows and that's what makes it easy to grow uh, crops. One of the things that happens is cities, which is the Latin word civil for civilization. So um, we see that in Egypt. We see that in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia was about city-states. You may have heard that phrase. Um, this uh, first culture in the Indus River Valley, the Harappan culture, uh, 2600 BC, dozens of towns and cities. There's the Vedic period, 1500, and then 1500 something happens. Now, this, it's called the pre-Aryan um, civilization because we don't know much about it because remember when we go past writing, when we go into archaeology, uh, we don't have much to go by. It, it's, it's difficult to interpret. It's like a Rorschach image. What does it mean? But this pre-Aryan, the Harappan civilization, was one of the most advanced on Earth. This is a, a notion we should get rid of, is that we are highly developed, more developed than any other uh, time in history. The ancient Mayans had complex civilization, Aztecs, uh, 
uh, mound builders here on this continent, uh, Egypt, Mesopotamia, China, and now the Indus River Valley, all very complex, very urban civilizations, that is, uh, cultures with cities. And so, uh, written language, they had a written language, um, pre-Hindu, like worship, although even that's hard to say because it, the, the problem is you read backwards, you, you, and you layer on what you know to what you don't know, and it's, I don't know. Uh, urban culture, running water, drains, wells, trash chutes, granaries, um, not bad for, you know, 2600 BCE, right? About 40,000 residents in some of these cities, amazing. Then in 1500 BC, the Aryans come in. Now, I, I'm very sorry that Hitler and his friends ruined that word for us. It's too bad because it doesn't mean anything remotely what he thought it meant. Um, I mean, I, maybe it does. It means noble ones. Uh, and it's a variant of the term Iran. So it's the people of ancient Persia, or at least that area. That's who came in to the Indus River Valley. And if you study Sikhism, which is a, a combination of um, Hinduism and Islam, you'll see how, uh, how this plays out. And then if, especially if you study Zoroastrianism, uh, where uh, Zoroaster actually, he's Persian, and he actually flips these Hindu notions on their head. Uh, anyway, we won't get into that. We can have a separate lecture on Zoroastrianism. But they come in and they develop what is more recognizably Hindu civilization. And 700 BCE, we start to see the formation of the Upanishads. Um, <clears throat> in our summer series passages, we're going to use a Upanishad in that series. It's very nice, very interesting. The great Indian epic, the Ramayana, uh, is composed 500 BCE. And then uh, Siddhartha Gautama in 490. So you can see what's happening here. Now, tonight's about Kali and Shiva, but we have to understand from the beginning that Hindu deities are unlike anything we know in the West. They're just hard to figure out, right, Pam? I mean, they can get confusing. <laughs> um, and that's because there's so many things. So Kali, as you're going to see, is actually emerges from a previous goddess who came from a previous goddess. And, and there are all these kind of manifestations, these kind of emerging deities from other deities, right? We don't really have that notion in the West. We like our deities separate and fairly distinct, right? Uh, which, yeah. And then <laughs> Hinduism, a Hindu might well tell you that uh, if you ask him which god he or she worships, he might say, it's a saying, which of the 330 million gods do you mean? Yes. So uh, there's not 330 million gods, but there's a lot of gods in Hinduism. And, and it's because they keep emerging out of one another. So Kali comes from Devi, or Mahadevi, the great goddess. So she seems to be the earliest form of the feminine in Hinduism, but even so, she embodies a principle, right? Now, here's another thing about Hindu deities. They're really about function. Uh, you know, uh, some of the Greek gods and some of the other gods, Mesopotamian or Egyptian gods, are, you kind of have to determine what their function is. Sometimes it's clear, sometimes you have to figure it out. Now, this is woven into the Hindu pantheon, is, is what they do. They are what they do. And so Devi, what she does is Shakti, which is the ultimate feminine principle. Um, Devi says this, I, Devi, have created all worlds at my will without being urged by any higher being. And I dwell within them. I permeate earth and heaven, all created entities with my greatness and dwell in them as eternal an infinite consciousness. Okay, so we keep talking about, you know, how far back do we go and what do we find when we get there? 
We saw this when we studied the theogony, the Greek story origin of the gods. There seems to be um, a woman, or at least a feminine principle at the beginning, and that would make sense. Now you could argue that there's nothing, that there's without form and void, but actually in the theogony at least, the void, the chaos, is feminine. So, I don't know, but you can determine that as we go through here. In Hinduism, it is Shakti, who, which is a force that gets embodied into Devi. And, and she herself gets embodied into Uma and Durga. And I'm going to tell you the, the second story, the Durga story. Uma, you may know, uh, becomes Parvati. So you see, they're, they're just emerging from each other. It's kind of beautiful to think of. Um, you know, like this force that, that exists and it starts roiling and then something else comes out of it and that's exactly some of the stories we're going to read is that, and then something else comes out of that. What does that tell you? That tells you that this culture in the Indus River Valley, Indus River Valley knows and values transformation. It's not a bug, it's a feature. Transformation, right? <laughs> It, and, and to be able to do that, right, to, to incorporate change into your mythology is a unique and beautiful and powerful thing. Because we in the West, we don't do that so well. We do it, but we don't do it this well. All right. Let me just read you some other um, uh, sayings of Devi. By you or this is a prayer to Devi, by you this universe is born, by you this world is created. O Devi, by you it is protected. This is from a Tantra, and we're going to see that um, Kali is related very much to Tantrism. Woman is the creator of the universe. The universe is her form. Woman is the foundation of the world. She is the true form of the body. In woman is the form of all things, of all that lives and moves in the world. There is no jewel rarer than woman, no condition superior to that of woman. So there it is. That's what I'm talking about. About as far back as you can go, what you find is woman. Now, let's, uh, let's go through these emergences of these goddesses. So Devi is a goddess. She is the embodiment of Shakti, but she, she's a god, goddess, she has form, and she does things in the world. So this is from a, a, a volume called the Khandapat. So there's, there's this demon, and he's, he's got a buffalo head and a human body, and he's just tearing up the world, just tearing up the world. Um, and Devi appears to take care of this demon this buffalo man, uh, she, and she ends up slaying him. So, um, Mahisa wanted this demon, his name Mahisa, he wanted to take over the world, and so he conjured an army of demons, a hundred, uh, uh, conjured an army of de demons and fought the gods for a hundred years. And, and then the gods actually get kicked out of heaven. They get kicked out of heaven by this demon. So this is no small thing. Uh, and so the gods get together and Brahma, not Brahman, but Brahma, one of the, the creator god, gives a rousing speech to his fellow gods, Vishnu and Shiva. And he starts talking about, what, what the hell just happened? We, we got kicked out by this demon. Um, <clears throat> and he gets Devi to come in and fix it. Devi um, emerges actually from the anger of Vishnu and Shiva. So Brahma gives this rousing speech. The, the other two get so angry that fire builds up in their mouths and Devi emerges. So even Devi comes from something else. Um, At the same time, uh, some energies come forth from the bodies of Indra and Yama and all the other gods. So there's this reaction. There's this divine reaction. 
and this energy, this tremendous energy starts to condense into a mass. Does this sound familiar, by the way? <laughs> yeah, it starts to condense into a mass. We might call it the singularity and forms the terrible goddess Durga. All right, so these goddesses are born of anger, of divine anger, which is interesting because remember Ishtar is angry. Although I don't think she's as angry as people say she is, but she's pretty angry. Now, here's the other thing about Hinduism. This is just one story about the birth of Durga, who actually becomes Kali. So <laughs> stay with me, okay? It's going to get very confusing. So you've got this emergence process, but then you've got many stories about this emergence process or other processes. So it gets very confusing very quickly. But that's okay because that is part and parcel of Hinduism, right? If you put transformation at the center of your mythology, then of course you're going to have transformation stories, right? And transformation stories within other transformation stories. That absolutely makes sense. So, in another story, uh, Durga is giving the ca given the task of seducing and killing this demon Mahisa. She hides herself in the blood red mountain and, be, and performs these acts of asceticism. So here's another feature of the Hindu mythology is asceticism, the, the denial of the body for the sake of enlightenment, right? Um, so the goddess sets four young boys as guards over her mountain place. Uh, and Mahisa hears about Durga, and he comes to seduce and perhaps kill her. And um, he, he manages to turn himself and his followers into birds. Transformation, right? And so they're able to get past the boys. And they, and he sees Durga and is aroused. Now this is another pretty common feature in world mythology, is that, at least in the older stories, when men, especially mortals, see the goddess and they react with lust, they get destroyed. Uh, the Lakota have a great story like this called the White Buffalo Woman, and where two warriors are out and one of them lusts and sees her and he's, a viscer, he's incinerated. And the other one recognizes the sacred and she brings him uh, with her. That's the key here. Do you recognize the sacred? Uh, Durga as goddesses do, dismisses him and says, no, thank you, and turns herself into fire. Uh, I don't know if you've had that experience, <laughs> but I think I might have. Um, Mahisa fleds, flees the scene, and I've certainly done that. Um, Durga and Mahisa, of course, meet again because they have to, because this is a story, and a story has to have a resolution. They, uh, they meet in the battlefield, finally. Again, many, many stories here I'm putting together. Uh, and they fight so hard that the mountains shake. The problem was that when Durga struck Mahisa, he shapeshifted. So he went from a buffalo to a man to a lion to an elephant and back to a buffalo. And at this moment, the goddess pounced on him and straddled him and stabbed him in the neck with her trident. That's another feature that we're going to see as a trident. At this, uh, the spirit of Mahisha came out of the mouth of the dying buffalo. Mahisha, his spirit came out. And Durga finally killed him by lopping off his head. We're going to see a lot of that tonight, too, so prepare yourself. Um, from the heavens there came a tremendous roar as the gods rejoiced at the fall of this awful demon. All right. So, we still haven't gotten to Kali, by the way. Um, so here's another story about Durga. And remember, Durga comes from Devi, and Devi is the embodiment of Shakti. All right. Um, Durga is in a battle. And she becomes so enraged that, I love this, that 
uh, Kali emerges from her forehead. Not emerges, bursts out of her forehead. She's fighting, she's angry, and Kali becomes the embodiment of her anger, right? So again, gods have functions here. They are, they are emotions, they are things in the world. <clears throat> Can you imagine that? And then that's Kali, right? So she's a black goddess. She's often portrayed as black or dark blue. Durga's fighting these demons. She's furious at these demons. Kali emerges and she runs around and eats them all. And then she strings their heads on a chain, which she wears around her neck, which you will see in coming images. Um, and then this is the moment. This is the moment we're going to linger on tonight, is that now Kali is going crazy. Um, she can't be stopped. Uh, the gods are fe fearful she's going to destroy the world. And so Shiva comes to her and does what? Well, if we were plotting a film here in America, he would have to fight her, right? He lies down. He just lies down. And something in that gesture, something in that movement, stops her rage and gives her pause and saves the world. Think about that. For a man to lie down in front of a raging woman. I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying mythologically, mythologically, that's pretty amazing. Um, and so Kali, because of that story and because of many other stories, is associated with cremation and death. In fact, I wore my blood and ash mm -hmm. outfit for Kali tonight. Kali also, in another story, emerges from Parvati. Um, Parvati sheds her skin, and Kali comes out of it. And so, one of her names, I believe it is in Bengali, is the sheath. Right? So, um, and so, Parvati is left as the fair one, while Kali becomes blackness and the symbol of of darkness and death, with the power to both create and destroy. All right, and then there is, um, uh, again, the men and gods are terrorized by a, a demon called Daruka, who could only be killed by a woman. And Parvati was asked by the gods to deal with this demon, Parvati the fair one, she responded by jumping down Shiva's throat. This was because years previously, Shiva had swallowed Halala. Uh, sorry, Hala Hala, sorry. Uh, which was the, the poison that was generated at the churning of the oceans at the beginning of the world during the creation. So during the creation, there's a poison. You can imagine there's all this churning, mixing, right? And that creates a poison and it's like Shiva comes in skims off the poison and swallows it. So she jumps in, goes down his throat to get this poison, and by the, combining the poison that was in Shiva's throat, Parvati is transformed into Kali, and Kali swiftly dispatches Daruka, and all is well with the world once more. And then finally, in, in another version of Kali's birth, I think, was that four? Yeah. There's the story of the terrible demon Rak Tabija, or blood seed. This demon was uh, causing a great deal of trouble with the men and gods. Uh, and then this, was, this one's interesting because every time you hurt this demon and he bled, it produced more demons. Right? So, uh, great science fiction here um, and mythology. So, the gods decide to get together and pool their Shakti their feminine energy or divine energy, and produce one super being who can destroy this being. And the result is Kali. Given all the divine weapons of the gods, Kali swiftly seeks out this demon and, and his other demons that have emerged from his blood uh, drops. 
and she proceeds to swallow them whole. And that way no more blood is spilled. Finally, only the demon Raktabija is left and Kali lops off his head with a sword and drinks all his blood. Making sure, of course, that none fell to the ground. So remember when you hear people talking about goddess culture and how wonderful and benign it is? <laughs> Just don't, don't misunderstand the goddesses. They will kill you. Right? If you they will kill you. I was going to say if, if you don't approach them correctly, but Kali will just kill you. It doesn't matter. <laughs> there she is. Necklace of skulls, severed head, Shiva, supine on the ground in a meditative state. This image, we're going to keep coming back to this image. Kali is unique. <laughs> you may have already determined that. She's a figure of the terrible and sublime and fusion. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading from Chaudhuri, a psychoanalytic study of the Hindu mother goddess concept. This is really interesting. Uh, she's a unique figure of the terrible and sublime and fusion. An undecomposed mother. I had to read that three times. An undecomposed mother figure of fear and love. With her two right hands, she's offering blessings and benedictions, her two right hands, and giving assurance. And in her left hand, she's holding an upright sword and a freshly severed human head. Come on, it's okay. <laughs> she's dancing a rhythmic dance, and she steps up con unconsciously on the static, passive figure, her consort, Shiva. She's black in color. She has three eyes and four hands. She wears a garland of human heads and a girdle of human hands. Her earrings are made of two dead infants. Okay, right. So what does this mean? Well, uh, there's another great image um, which reminds us of the Egyptian image, right? Of Geb and Newt. Um, she vanquishes, well, she threatens stability, first of all, let's not, and so we're going to have these opposites, is what I'm going to tell you. There's going to be these conflicting features and roles of Kali, and that, again, is a feature, not a bug. That's part of the Hindu worldview. So David Kinsley, who's written a lot on Kali, says this, uh, although she may be said to serve order, in her role of the slayer of demons. More often than not, she becomes so frenzied on the battlefield, usually becoming drunk on the blood of her victims, that she herself begins to destroy the world she's supposed to protect. Often, her consort Shiva, of the mythic couple, um, she urges him to excess. Now, he's, he's similar. He's kind of a mirror image. He's the creator and the destroyer, but he's more, he's more flat. You know, he doesn't have these sharp um, <clears throat> urges and excesses. I mean, he does, but, but she kind of gets him going, right? Uh, she exercises more influence on him than, she, than he does on her. Uh, again, this is uh, Kinsley. It's his wife, as it were, provoking him and encouraging him in his mad, antisocial, and often disruptive habits. It's never Kali who tames Shiva. Uh, Shiva who must calm Talvi. Ta uh, Kali, sorry. <laughs> her association with criminals reinforces her dangerous role in society. She's at home outside the moral order and seems to be unbounded by that order. You may have heard of the Thugis who I believe is 19th century or early 20th century, were basically a bunch of thugs, thugies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right? They're just robbers and punks, but they invoked Kali as their uh, goddess, and uh, it was a real problem, actually. Um, now, I said uh, Kali's related to tantrism. Tantra is a Sanskrit word that simply means manual, and so it's, it's kind of its own religion, 
um, or religious strain at least within Hinduism and Buddhism. It, it gets a unique flavor in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. But it's, it's really about magic and spells because that's why you need a manual, right? Is to remember all these spells and instructions and things. You know, if you're the Upanishads, if, if you're a, you know, a, a thinking Hindu, you don't need a manual, you just need the Upanishads, which, you know, the main ones are just... But if you're doing rituals and magic, you need a manual, and that's a Tantra. Uh, I love this image. Um, in the Nirvana Tantra, the gods Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva are said to arise from Kali, from Kali, like bubbles from the sea, endlessly arising and passing away, but leaving their source unchanged. What a great metaphor for Hinduism, and maybe for life, right? They arise from her like bubbles from the sea, endlessly arising and passing away, leaving their source unchanged. Um, compared to Kali, uh, this text says the Nirvana Tantra, Brahma, Vishu, and Vishnu, and Shiva are like the amount of water in a cow's hoof print compared to the waters of the sea. There's some poetry here in Hinduism, by the way, if you hadn't noticed. Um, I love this. Shiva praises her. Shiva. So again, there seems to be this deference to the feminine in Hinduism. Shiva says this, um, at the dissolution of things, which he would know about, because he's over that, uh, it is Kali, uh, whose name means time, by the way. So, well, it means black time, but... So again, there's this merging of form and function. It is Kali who will devour all. And since you devour Mahakala himself, it is you who are the supreme prim primordial, Kali. Because you devour time, Kala, you are Kali, the original form of all things. And because you are the origin of and devour all things, you are called Adya, Kali. Resuming after dissolution your own form, dark and formless, you alone remain as one ineffable and inconceivable. Though having a form, you are formless. Though yourself without beginning multiform by the power of Maya, you are the beginning of all. Creatrix, protectress, deconstructress that you are. Isn't that amazing? Beautiful. All right, so Shiva. Shiva is much more well known. That's not Shiva. That's an, another form of Shiva, not the Raja. Uh, but there is the Trimurti in Hinduism that you might know of the three main gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma is the creator god. Vishnu is the preserver god. Shiva is both. He's the creator and the destroyer. Of course he would be with Kali. She's the same thing, only times ten. He is the god of time, uh, therefore destruction. He is the god of endings, therefore beginnings. Uh, maybe like Janus in Rome, if you know that god, the two-faced god who looks backwards and forwards at the same time. Uh, the god of extremes. So, again, the god of extremes. Therefore, Shiva is the god of eroticism, and we're going to talk about that, but also asceticism. Right? So, imagine the imagination that came up with this, these gods. Right? Because we create gods in our image, and what these gods are, are an understanding of ourselves in the world that comes out of the Indus River Valley. And it is so different from what I grew up with, where the world is split into parts. There's no split here. There's just this constant, it's those bubbles coming out, out of the sea, right? And, and the sea itself isn't changed, but, but then it is because the bubble, and, you know, it's transformation at the center instead of the edges. Wonderful stories here. Uh, Shiva is responsible for the creation of the Ganges River most important uh, religious river in India. Um, the, there were constant quarrels always with the gods. And um, 
uh, Ganga was the god of the river uh, who was up there quarreling and one of her this is not the logical this is the mythological um, so to cushion Ganga's fall Shiva uh, catches uh, her in his hair and so she can she can just fall through his hair isn't that beautiful and so she cushions and then and of course hair looks like a river of course Ganesha our old friend Ganesha the elephant headed god uh, Shiva had a son with Parvati uh, another consort uh, the god Ganesha uh, the boy uh, Ganesha was in fact and he was a boy a humanoid boy created out of earth and clay to keep Parvati company and protect her because Shiva would go off on these wanderings to meditate uh, etc Shiva returned one day um, <laughs> I guess he'd been a long away a long time because he didn't recognize his son Ganesha and his son is watching over Parvati while she's bathing you know keeping giving her her, her privacy and uh, Shiva says who are you and he says I'm your son dude what are you talking about and Shiva doesn't believe him thought he was a beggar or someone not who didn't belong there um, and then he calls up some demons anyway he ends up cutting off his head his son's head uh, and Parv Parvati of course hears this she rushes from her bath um, and screams you've killed my son you've killed my son and realizing that he screwed up Shiva sends for a new head as one does um, and the nearest thing around was an elephant so the poor elephant gets its head chopped off and put on the boy and that is the god Ganesha who has its own, his own following a uh, pretty strong following in India right the elephant headed god all right so who is Shiva well he is known as kind friendly gracious auspicious Isn't it interesting that that's how he's known and he's essentially the mirror image of Kali but he's kind friendly gracious and auspicious he's also he probably began as Rudra uh, in the Vedas um, which and again these gods are all hard to separate and they emerge from each other but probably related to Agni the god of fire and Indra um, he has the third eye which you may know uh, which means he's able to see the things that ordinary people don't see. He's able to see deeper uh, and obtain a, a enlightenment. And he is also, also Nataraja. Right? He dances, uh, Nataraja, which means king of the dance, basically, lord of the dance. He dances with a circular, within a circular arch of, of flames which symbolically represent the cosmic fire Agni uh, that creates and consumes everything so again fire is a perfect symbol because it creates and consumes at the same time and the cyclic nature of life right? um, his legs are bent meaning he's in motion he's in motion right? uh, his long matted tresses I never knew this till I studied this are shown to be loose and flying out in thin strands during the dance you can see that there uh, spread into a fan behind his said his head because he's dancing so wildly and with such ecstasy Isn't that marvelous on his right side meshed in with one of the flying strands of hair on his forehead is the river Ganges uh, symbol of uh, the goddess Ganges um, because he's always associated with her the upper right hand holds a small drum shaped like an hourglass Damaru the Damaru drum uh, a specific hand gesture the mudra um, is used to hold the drum it symbolizes rhythm and time of course that makes sense the upper left hand can contains Agni or fire again force of creation and destruction a cobra uncoils from his lower right forearm while his palms show the mudra meaning fearlessness uh, meaning he's conquered what the snake represents 
Uh, okay, I'm not going to go over this. Uh, you can uh, look this up on your own and come look at it later. Lots of symbolism here. What do we do with Kali and Shiva? I love this um, because the early uh, scholars of religion didn't know what to do with them, uh, as you might imagine. We get this a lot, actually, in, with anthropologists studying native people on this continent who are like, what? Uh, for example, read about the urine ceremony of the Apache sometime. That's U-R-I-N-E. And better yet, read the uh, anthropologist's responses to it. So, uh, here's, here's one of these guys, uh, a 19th century Indologist, who says that the worship of the goddess Kali represented the worst results of the worst superstitious ideas that have ever disgraced and degraded the human race. Um, so, he kind of tempered his thoughts there. I love, that's going to sound weird. Um, what the hell, I'll just say it. I love Kali's tongue. I, I think it's, it's really important in the symbolism. Um, uh, another scholar says, a tongue that at once seeks blood, and so to suggest a violent mode of being, also expresses a sense of shame for its urges. Now, I didn't think that was right, uh, but I did some more research on it, and apparently, um, Kali is especially known uh, among in Bengali, and, and that is what happens in that part of India. Is, and, and anthropologist talks about seeing a woman. She's, he's watching her do something, and she gets embarrassed, and she sticks her tongue out. So that's custom. That seems to be a custom. And so the story, that custom gets taken up into the story. Uh, so in that moment where she steps on Shiva... Here's a text from that era, area. Seeing Shiva, the goddess becomes aware of her actions, and as one of the informants, sorry, one of the informants describes it, when she put her foot on Shiva's chest, she bit her tongue, saying, oh, my husband. And when the anthropologist asked what that meant here, they said, what else but shame? Interesting. Uh, so remember, we talked about how we're going to get, we're going to study both the ethnic notions and the universal or common ideas, right? So in terms of ethnic notions, that seems to be the meaning of Kali's tongue. Um, and and this, that gesture, that stepping on Shiva is something to be ashamed of. But that doesn't really sit well in terms of the commonality of the mythology and in terms of the mythological interpretation of the story, right? Why would she be ashamed? Nothing she's ever done in these other stories indicates any shame of any kind, right? So, I don't know. What might those modern meetings be? Well, she's black. The Mahan Nirvana Tantra says, just as all colors disappear in black, so all names and forms disappear into her. Now that's how you, that's how you study the symbolism of these myths, right? Nudity. Uh, there's, uh, there's another text I read where this devotee of Kali, and there are plenty of devotees of Kali, he's trying to pray to her and he says, Mother Kali, why do you have to be naked? Really? I mean, I want to worship you, but you're naked all the time. What is, what's up with that? Uh, so she's a difficult figure. Uh, the nudity is pr primeval, fundamental, transparent, like nature, of course. The earth, sea, and sky. She's free from the illusory covering, for she is beyond all Maya or consciousness. Yes. Remember last week the beautiful and painful descent of Ishtar, and for her to get to the bottom of the underworld, she must remove a piece of clothing, clothing at each of the seven gates. So yes, uh, the 50 heads, um, people think that's the 50 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. I didn't know that, but of course, also symbolizes infinite knowledge. Um, the supine uh, Shiva. 
Let me just read this to you because I think it gets it. Um, according to uh, the Tantras, there are two distinct ways of perceiving the same absolute reality. The first is a transcendental plane that's often described as static yet infinite. It is here that there is no matter, there is no universe, and only consciousness exists. This form of reality is known as Shiva, the absolute existence, knowledge, and bliss. The second is the active plane, an eminent plane, the plane of matter, of Maya. That is where the illusion of space-time and the appearance of the actual universe does exist. This form of reality is called Kali or Shakti and is still specified uh, as the same absolute. Again, so there's not this hierarchy that we're used to. They're the same absolutes. They're both true. It is here that the second, in the second plane that the universe, as we know it, is experienced and described by the tantric seer as the play of Shakti, or the goddess as mother Kali. When one meditates on reality at rest, or as absolute pure consciousness, one refers to this as Shiva, or Brahman. When one meditates on reality as dynamic and creative, one refers to this as Kali, or Shakti. In either case, one is interested in the same reality, the only difference being in name and fluctuating aspects of, of appearance and experience, I would add. It is this which is generally accepted as the meaning of Kali standing on the chest of Shiva. Shiva is inactive while Kali is active. Shiva represents Brahman, not Brahma, but Brahman, the absolute pure consciousness that is beyond all names, forms, and activities. Kali, on the other hand, represents Shakti, or the creative power behind all consciousness. She can never exist apart from Shiva, nor act independently of him. Shakti, all the matter energy of the universe, is not distinct from Shiva, Brahman, but is rather the dynamic power of Brahma. I found some images, uh, I, because I think Kali is such an imagistic deity, right? I mean, you've seen some of the ones I've shown you already. So I like this one. I, I always like to bring it into the contemporary world if I can. So here's some contemporary art, uh, just a few things. Uh, Kali, the Black Mother, I love that because it picks up the energy that we were just talking about. Uh, yeah, and the blackness. And yet it's abstract enough that it can be a lot of things. There's the snake. This was what we call a fortunate accident. So I was searching on Kali and modern art or contemporary art or something, and this popped up, and I'm like, oh, yes, that's her. Turns out the artist's name is Kali. That's the only connection, except maybe not, right? Because isn't that Kali, right? I love that. I love that image regardless, but. And then, of course, you know, I think about all these goddesses. I kind of live with these goddesses in between. While you get to go and do whatever you do, I'm stuck with these goddesses. And so they kind of appear to me when I don't ask them to. So I was on Instagram the other day and I saw this. And it was, it was in some post about how LA is going to hell yet again uh, because this just showed up somewhere and I'm like, oh my God, it's Kali. <laughs> All right, thank you.